Okay, um, again, uh, welcome to all of you uh, to Minute. I'm going to do this very quickly because I'm very conscious that uh, we're at lunchtime. Um, uh, in contrast to what uh, Kriya and Niall, uh, Anil have told you, um, th they're working outside the Earth's atmosphere. I'm looking at features in the Earth's atmosphere, and so Kriya's final slide showed us some uh, green uh, uh, aurora, uh, and so that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in. Um, the title of my talk uh, is called The Middle Atmosphere, Earth's Ignorosphere, so I'm going to zip through this at a fierce rate. Um, if I show you quickly uh, an average temperature profile of the Earth, so this is altitude on this scale here, <laughs> And so the red line shows you temperature. So you have the familiar feature where if you climb to the top of a mountain, it gets cooler. And then if you go further up to about, say, uh, somewhere around 30 or 40 kilometers, the temperature begins to increase again. And that's, of course, largely due to absorption of uh, UV by uh, ozone and by water vapor. And so you get a bulge in the temperature profile. It then stands, tends to drop off again. And you get this region here called the mesopause at, at the top of what we call the mesosphere. And so mesos... Uh, from the Greek word meaning middle, represents the middle atmosphere. So this is region, the region, the atmosphere that I'm interested in. Um, if you continue on, you have the thermosphere and the exosphere. Uh, I could talk to you about it, but we don't really have the time to do it today. So um, the, the area that I'm interested in studying is this region here. So if we think about it, we're looking straight up 80 kilometers. So that's the kind of thing that you, uh, we're doing. I have a little uh, graph here on the side which gives you some idea of some of the features that uh, we see in, in various uh, Altitudes, so we have uh, um, aircraft flying in the region 6 to 20 kilometers. We can send weather balloons up to about 40 kilometers or so. Uh, meteors uh, impact on the Earth and, and burn up around, say, 80 or between 80 and 90 kilometers. Then we have the green aurora, which uh, Kriya showed us a nice picture of there. That, that comes from about 95 kilometers. And then we have the shuttle up here. The, this is the scale. The two scales don't match. The shuttle is about, say, 650, 700 kilometers and so uh, on into, into dark space. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, I'll skip through all this. Uh, okay, now, the mesosphere is my interest, as I've told you already. Um, it's too high for aircraft. If you want to make in situ measurements, um, it's too high for aircraft, and it's too high for balloons, and it's too low for satellites. If you put a satellite at this altitude, it'll have a very short lifetime. And so making in situ measurements isn't really an option. And uh, this is the reason, uh, this is one of the reasons why it has been termed the ignorosphere, because it was just too difficult to do anything about it, and people just left it alone. Um, so uh, in, in more recent years, we've begun to make some, some progress on that. One of the reasons that it's of interest to, to people is that meteors, just uh, as, as a general figure, we, the, the Earth is impacted by 40 tonnes a day of meteors, which certainly the first time I heard it was a surprise to me. Um, so that gives you an idea. Um, the, the, this region is also where uh, gravity waves break. Now, they're not gravity waves in the sense that Priya was telling you about. These are gravity waves, the ones that we're more familiar with. Um, uh, the, to distinguish them from what Priya was talking about, typically we say gravitational waves to describe uh, the kind of waves that we see from uh, various objects in, in space. Um, by gravity wave, what I mean is if we have a flat pond and it's uh, with water, and if I drop in a stone, then we are familiar with the, with the ripples that we see going out. And so we, that's, everybody's familiar with that. Uh, the, the point about those waves is that that interface between air and water is a method or provides a method for us to visualize the restoring force of gravity, which causes the, the, the water to flatten out again. So it's the, the wave is propagated by the restoring force, which is in fact in gravity in this case. Now, if you think of that restoring force of gravity, it's working at, at all levels. Uh, it's just that we can see it nicely at the interface. That's why we sort of talk about it. But that force, that gravitational force, is working at every, at every layer in the atmosphere. And so if you, uh, say, generate a wave, for example, if you have a thunderstorm, right, so big impact of energy into the Earth's atmosphere, it propagates in all directions, including upwards. And so... Um, uh, what happens is when the energy propagates upwards, um, the density decreases, and in order for the energy to propagate, the amplitude of the wave has to increase. And so what you get, a, a relatively small wave down at the Earth's surface, by the time it reaches the, the mesosphere, where it typically tends to break, is, can be a very large amplitude wave. And so that's sort of things that we're interested in. Um, okay, uh, noctilucent clouds, I, I might have a, a minute to tell you about that, but uh, noctilucent clouds are very high altitude clouds. Their exact altitude is around 82 kilometers. They've been, it's been known, they, they were discovered after the Krakatoa uh, uh, volcano in about 1884. There was no record of them ever before that. And one of the things about noctilucent clouds that interests people is that um, 
the, their frequency of occurrence has been increasing ever since 1884, since they were first observed. Now, it's not clear whether it's a, it's a, it's a lack of observations on the one hand or that, in fact, the, the increase is due to us putting more water vapour into the air, which is actually forming the clouds. So it could be, in fact, a signal of climate change. So this question is still open, and that's one of the areas that I'm kind of interested in. Uh, but I, I, I may not have time to tell you about it all today. OK, I'm going to show you a few little things. Again, one of the things that was characteristic of both Neil and Crea's talk is they talked to you about spectra. Now, what I'm showing you in this spectrum, this is, this is very much in the, uh, mostly in the visible uh, and near-infrared spectrum. And so I, I want to show you just one or two things. Um, so uh, we see, uh, if you look at a spectrum of the night sky, so if I set a telescope and I look into what I consider to be a space where there are no stars, and I record that for, say, maybe an hour or something like that, I get this kind of spectrum. So I don't, I'm not absolutely looking at stars, but what I am looking at is what's coming from the Earth's atmosphere. And so what we see is lots of light pollution, so from mercury and sodium lamps, so we see lots of that. And we can see quite clearly there's a, there's a line here, which is the auroral green line. Even when there's no aurora, which is to us visible, there, the line is still present in the atmosphere. There's an auroral red line, which is at 630 nanometers, which is about here. And there's all sorts of other features which I won't go into. The one point I do want to tell you about is that if you go up into the near infrared, you see a lot of emissions, and these emissions come from uh, a particular uh, uh, chemical species called OH, hydroxyl. Now, hydroxyl is a very strange molecule. It's one of the most reactive molecules in the atmosphere, um, and so down on the ground, we don't see a great deal of it. Um, however, there's uh, enough time for hydroxyl to exist. Uh, when you reach the, the level of the mesopause, up around 80 or 90 kilometers, OH can exist and has plenty of time to reach thermal equilibrium with the gas up there, and it can emit radiation. And what we see here in this region of the spectrum is, in the near infrared, we see a lot of OH. And if, we, if, if, this was in the, if this was in the visible part of the spectrum, if we went out at night, when we look up, we'd see a red sky. Unfortunately, it's not, and so we don't see it at all. But we can see it with instruments. So that's um, if, just in the visible and near infrared. Now... Um, if I, on this graph, I'm going a little bit further than that, so this is still wavelength at this scale here now, so I'm showing you, this is the visible spectrum, and so we have, the, 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 uh, the scale is a little bit different. Now, if we continue on, if, if, I, if, I had a spec, if I had a spectrometer which went further into the near infrared, what we would see is, this, this sort of uh, line of dots here shows you the progression of the infrared radiation. So, what you see is that the more that you go into near infrared, the more radiation you've got. So if you're sitting on the ground and you want to detect photons, and there aren't that many of them about in the first place, you want to go to a place where you can see as many of them as you can. So in the visible spectrum, we haven't got so many of them down here. This scale gives you some kind of indication of the, the level of the light. And so the further into the infrared you go, the more you're going to get. So ideally, you want to go up here. You can see this is the maximum, right? So that would be the ideal case. The problem is that your detector gets more inefficient as you go this way. So you're... Uh, the light that you're going to look at is increasing in this direction, but your detector efficiency is falling off here. And so what you do is you try and match the, the increase in the light with the fall off in the detector to some extent. And so you find the region. So most of the observations that we are making here at Minute are in this region here, between 1 and 1.6 microns. And so um, just skipping forward quickly, one thing that uh, is vital, if you want to look at a layer in the atmosphere, you want to choose a molecule which is well localised in altitude. So these OH emissions from a lot of rocket experiments which were done all around the, the globe in the 60s and 70s, we know that these emissions come from a well-defined layer in the atmosphere and it's centred on about 87 kilometres. And so here you see some profiles of different emissions and the, the, the different, this is, these are different vibrational states of hydroxyl. And the key point that I want to show you is that when we look at that light, we know what altitude we're looking at in the atmosphere. Do you get the idea? So that's, that's a key point. Now, one other key point, which is they have to have a lifetime which is sufficiently long that the molecule that emits the radiation has thermalized with, with the ambient situation in that region. So that when it emits a photon, it's representative of that region of the atmosphere. So you need to know that they're in the right place and they have to have sufficiently long lifetimes. So typically, uh, uh, one of these hydroxyl will have made more than 100 collisions with, with other ones before it emits the photon. So when you look at this, the details. So skipping forward very quickly... This is a spectrum which we have recorded at Minute using a near-infrared spectrometer. It's, it's a Michelson interferometer, effectively. Uh, and so you see some spectral lines here. Now, the, without going into the detail, which we don't have the time for, what you notice is that the ones that I've highlighted here, 
Um, these are individual spectral lines from rotational states from the hydroxyl. Hydroxyl is made up of an oxygen and a, hyd and a hydrogen, and so it, it has rotational states. And what you find is that these, the, the population in the rotational states is very sensitive to temperature. So if I increase the temperature, I uh, populate the higher states more. If I drop the temperature, I, the, the lower states are populated more. And so these particular, if we look at ratios of these spectral lines, we're able to get an, a, a way of measuring the temperature. And that's the trick. So we look at the spectral lines and we measure uh, how intense various ones are and we choose the lines carefully so that they're not absorbed by water vapour or any other feature between us and where the layer is and so on. All of these kind of good things. And so you get the temperature out. So if I, uh, relative intensities of these lines are very sensitive to temperature. So, um, okay, I won't go through this, but basically what it says is, um, okay, uh, what it says is, th th this, is, this is the intensity of a given line is given by all these features. It's a, it's a nonlinear equation. Okay, a lot, most of you will be familiar with the Boltzmann term. There's a Boltzmann term in there involving temperature. You linearize the equation, ultimately you get into a nice clean equation, and ultimately you have a slope which is one over temperature, and we get the temperatures back out. So skipping forward, this is one night of data recorded at Maynooth. It was back in 93. I mean, it, it just happens to be a slide I have. But the blue points represent temperature. And so the, these are the error bars in the temperature. So just to give you an idea of the scale, this is temperature on this scale. So you're talking about somewhere of the order of about, say, 210 or 220 Kelvin, right? So it's quite cold. Um, these purple ones are the intensity, but we're not so concerned about those right now. So this is the scale. So that's one night, and so that's midnight there, around 24. So if I take each of those nights and... So what I'm showing you in this plot now, okay, this is one year of data. So this is January the 1st, and that's 30 December, December 31st up there. And so this is midnight going down along the middle, right? And so the colour is indicating the temperature. So the temperatures, the hot temperatures are uh, the red uh, squares and the cold temperatures are the blue. So uh, temperatures greater than 240 are in red and temperatures less than 160 Kelvin are in blue. So, uh, so just, just a couple of features of, of the plot. As I said, this is midnight, so the first thing you notice is that the nights of observation, all of these observations are made during the night time, because you can only do that, you have, uh, anyway, okay, for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> right, so, the nights are longer in the winter, and they're shorter in the summer, so that's the first point we notice, right? Second thing we notice is that there are lots of gaps. One problem of doing this kind of thing at a place like Minute is clouds, right? A lot of clouds, and so you've got clouds, all the gaps are clouds, so it runs all the time, continuously, every night. The third thing that you notice, which might surprise you, is, okay, we've got the cold temperatures in the summer and the hot temperatures in the winter. That isn't immediately obvious why this should be. And so I have to tell you uh, uh, and take, give a little bit longer to your dinner. Okay, here's the, here's the, the sort of explanation. Okay, so if I have, if this is, if this is the, uh, a picture of, of uh, in terms of latitude, so this is the, the, the South Pole or the Summer Pole, and that's the Winter Pole, it doesn't matter which is which. Okay, so in the summer pole, you have infrared radiation. It's absorbed largely um, by, a, a, lot, a lot of it radiation is absorbed by the water vapour and, and ozone in this region of about 30 to 40 kilometres. So it heats up that region of the atmosphere. It causes expansion, and so you have adiabatic expansion. The atmosphere expands up this way. And so that adiabatic expansion, by the time it reaches the mesosphere, gives you cooling. You get, you get cooling. So you get cooling in the summer pole. Now that drives what we call a meridional circulation cell. So it drives it this way, and so you get the opposite effect in the winter. And so in the winter time, you get uh, the, the air is coming back down, and so you get adiabatic heating. And so what you have is, it, it works, it's the complete inverse of what we expect in the normal situation, and it's largely due to adiabatic heating and cooling. So that, that explains the, the phenomena that we see in the previous diagram. So, and, and it's well, well understood at this stage. But anyway, it's nice to see it, and it's nice to see it reproduced. So quickly skipping forward. Okay, these are, this is three years of data, and so you see the uh, cold summers, uh, oops, sorry, cold summers, warm winters. And so these are, uh, the white dots uh, were measured at Minute, and the red dots were measured at 51 degrees north in Germany. And so you, very good correspondence, and we can look at all that kind of thing there. Um, now, so why are we doing all this? Well, um, in the low atmosphere, we're continually uh, discussing uh, global warming, and making these measurements of global warming is quite a challenge. Just exactly how much did the Earth warm up? Well, in order to get that figure for a given place, you have to take a lot of measurements all around the planet. One of the reasons that people are interested in this kind of work is the following, that at the level of the mesopause, the atmosphere is very tenuous. And if you are looking for uh, early indications of global change, one way to go about doing it is to look at somewhere where the atmosphere is very sensitive to change. Right? Now, 
we're to, on, at ground level, we talk about global warming. And the reason for that is because the, the outgoing infrared radiation is trapped inwards, right? Now, what that causes is you get global cooling at, at a layer which is above the, the layer which is trapping us in. So we get global cooling above it. So what we're looking for in these uh, annual cycles is, is there any evidence of global cooling? Now, this shows you, I think, uh, 18 years of data from the German station that we're working with. And so the trend there is minus 2.3 Kelvin plus or minus 1 per decade, per decade now, right? So these are difficult figures to measure. But if you want to see, right, are we, are, are we slowing down what we're doing to the atmosphere? One place to go looking for it is, instead of trying to look for it on the ground where we have to measure, you know, tiny amounts is, we can actually try and measure it at a place where the atmosphere is much more sensitive. And that's one of the reasons that we do this thing. So that's one type of thing that we do. Um, okay, I won't show you that slide, but if I can get out of this and show you one other thing before I stop. Um, we do one other thing, which is we measure, we, we take an image of the sky at night in, in the OH. And so here's, here's uh, if I can run this just, uh, okay, if I can get it to go, uh, select a list from a program. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get this to run now, but let's see. Okay. Uh, ah, this, this ran yesterday. Uh, select a program from a list. You'll have to bear with me a second. Um, yeah, browse. This is really terrible. Um, okay. I need to find the, the, the disk. Yeah, great stuff. I'm getting there. Uh, okay. Now, okay, I'm going to have to slow this down. Just bear with me for a second while I get this back under control. Yeah, okay. And then increase the gain, yeah, okay. Right, that's too slow. Right, okay. So, what am I showing you here? Um, what I'm showing you here is an image taken from here, uh, and we do this every night, um, and it's showing you uh, 25 kilometers square of the sky. And so it's like if you can imagine, right, we're looking up at 25 kilometers square and we have a 16 by 16 array on that and it's showing you the intensity of the OH layer. So just, just watch it. Uh, and, okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Now I need, to I need to slow it down a bit more, sorry. One, one moment, okay. We'll get, okay. So we get one image every minute. So this is the time, 21.58. So this is, this is in universal time now, right? So this is about 9 o'clock in the evening, 10 o'clock, right? So this is the number of the frame. This tells you things about temperature. And so what we're looking at is waves, gravity waves propagating through this layer. And so rather than just looking for you know, long-term climate change, we look at the character of these waves. And we, people who are involved in atmospheric modeling, including myself, need to know the spectrum of these waves in order to be able to get an energy balance between the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere. And so one of the things we do is we try and characterize these gravity waves. And so... Um, if, we, if you can just bear with me for a second, it'll, it'll, it'll run through, and, and this, is, this, is, this is the end of my presentation, but you'll get a sense of it. Okay, so just, just, just watch the waves now. Okay, so it's going to, it's, okay, we're at midnight, so we've only got five hours to go. Okay, so this is, this, is, this is imaged, and we look at these, and what we do is, sometimes it, this guy is very messy. I've tried to, to pick one which is fairly clear. So you can see, the, you know, yeah, so you can see the big rollers coming in here. And so we look at the amplitude, the frequency, the period uh, uh, of the waves. And as I say, we use those in, in mathematical models to try and get the energy balance in the atmosphere right. So that just gives you some idea of the kind of thing that we do, and I'll stop there. Thank you.